Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 37 I want that ship found, Lieutenant. I don't care if it takes every fighter, gunship, and corvette we have. I want the Dunkirk located within the hour. Doverly out. Honora waited impatiently for the magneto lift doors to open. There was one man aboard who could shed light on the events of the last thirty minutes, and he just happened to be locked in the Argent's brig. When the lift doors opened, a detachment of Marines was waiting. I'll put my hands around his neck and leave him just enough air to explain himself, Commander Doverly muttered. She marched towards the detention deck with the four heavily armed marines from Second Paladins trailing her path. She rounded the corner into the detention section. Sergeant, open Brig A. Yes, ma'am. The duty sergeant keyed his identifier and the heavy security door released its vapor seal and silently pivoted on its balanced magnetic hinges. The Argent's executive officer strode into the bay where the total prisoner population of one waited. All right, Colonel, it's time for answer. Atwell's cell was empty. Chapter 38 Brittany Hawkins rounded the corner into the center deck passage on deck four of DSS Exeter at exactly the wrong moment, or exactly the right moment depending on your side. The intruders had their backs turned. The lieutenant dove into a service junction and drew her weapon. She keyed her comlink and set it to intraship. Hawkins to bridge. Nothing. Hawkins to bridge, come in. Emergency. Static. Jammed? Without time to make a plan, Hawkins peered out into the hallway, pulling her blaster weapon up by her ear. A sudden grasping weight slammed her against the bulkhead. She tried to turn under her attacker's hands, but she was off balance and stumbled out into the hall. Her weapon clattered to the deck just before a gloved clout spun her back against a locked hatch. At that moment, a Marine PFC rounded the corner. Hey! Everyone looked up at once. The black-suited intruder and the Marine grappled violently for a moment before the PFC was heaved back. Hawkins dove for her weapon. A blast of white-hot plasma energy impacted the bulkhead. Showers of sparks lit up the small hallway and junction just as the Marine regained his footing. The lights flickered. Intruders! Intru! A hard arm to the neck silenced the young PFC, but the sharp sound of his warning had carried. Three more men and one woman emerged from hatches on either side of the cross corridor and ran towards the disturbance. Finally, Hawkins gathered up her weapon and opened up on the large group of unidentified personnel at the opposite end of the center deck passage. She fired twice, hitting one in the leg and missing wide with her second shot. A burst of rapid-fire plasma answered and she scrambled into the cross corridor. A voice shouted from further down the hall, Sound the deck alarm! Repel boarders! All Exeter Marines acknowledge. Hawkins finally got to her feet and ran towards the small squad. The lights shifted red and the ship-wide alert system began to sound. What have we got, ma'am? A young strike sergeant who couldn't have been older than twenty asked. Two dozen. Armed. Not sure why they picked Deck 4 or how they got aboard, but there you have it. Communications are... Hawkins's comlink beeped. Bridge. Get me the officer of the watch. Commander Pierce has the con. Report. Intruders. Deck 4. Exeter First Marines engaging. Hawkins out. The sergeant pulled the bolt on his TK-40. What's the word, ma'am? Hawkins glared past the wide contusion on the left side of her face, still trying to catch her breath. Get those bastards off my ship, sergeant. The young Marine hefted his shock rifle and grinned. Yes, ma'am. Chapter 39 Lunar emerged from Survey Station 19's jamming field just in time to hear DSS Exeter's sit-rep. 
Constellation and Minstrel were already veering in the chunky little destroyer's direction to provide screening and protection from any potentially hostile vessels. The minibot's sensors did not have the range of the larger ships, but Lunar was able to verify there were no hostile contacts in his command area. For now. He added himself to the Perseus datanet and requested instructions from the Force Command battle computer. He was directed to establish contact with Exeter, relay his message, and then join Exeter's escort formation. So that's exactly what he did. Exeter's communications officer shouted over the overlapping orders and general urgency on the bridge. I have a priority message from Commander Task Force Perseus. There was near instant silence. Say again? It's from Commander Hunter. On screen, Pierce ordered. The comms officer switched displays and Jace Hunter appeared on the Exeter's main viewer. This is Hunter on Survey Station 19. My minibots have engaged intruders near record storage. We have wounded. I need Exeter squads 2 and 4 and an emergency medical team to board this station and relieve our landing party immediately. All ships to battle stations, intruder protocols. I want a hard perimeter around Station 19 at 500 miles. Unidentified ships get one warning. Hunter out. The Exeter Bridge went to work with the quiet, smooth efficiency Skywatch was known for. In a matter of moments, orders had been coded and received by the Exeter First Marines, and assault ships were powering up their engines. It just so happened this was all taking place during a brutal firefight on Exeter's Deck 4. Sooner, Lieutenant Hawkins climbed past a grim-faced squad of heavily armed Marines and ran up to the man she had originally come to Deck 4 to see. Brittany! What the hell are you doing here? This place is a shooting gallery. What happened? She always got a flutter when she saw that tough face change into a look of tender concern for her. Sooner guided her into a small, out-of-the-way room to avoid the quick-moving security details filling the cross corridor outside. Your face is bruised. The moment the door closed, she reached up and hugged his neck and kissed him desperately. Then they embraced tightly and she sighed. I was so worried you would run out a door at the wrong time. She gushed, eyes closed. You're not going to tell me why your face is bruised, are you? Nope. Gunnery Sergeant Jack Sooner Daly held Hawkins and stroked her hair. Times like this were always hard on the two young Skywatch leaders. Their whirlwind affair had begun at the Academy, where Daly had been a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. In the six weeks between Hawkins' graduation and her official acceptance of an officer's commission, falling in love with her martial arts instructor was technically not against regulations. The two lovers found themselves assigned to the same ship not long after. Their professional relationship only made things more awkward since technically she now outranked him. There was also the small matter of officers and gunnery sergeants being prohibited from fraternizing. You need to get out of here and someplace safe. I'm accompanying the team down to the station, she replied. He took a breath to answer and she put her fingers on his lips. No arguments this time, baby. I think I know what the intruders are after and I need to be on that station and get the commander to greenlight my theory. Just get me a tack suit and a power pack for my weapon. It will interfere with my squad. And why is that? Because my squad sergeant is going to be too distracted trying to keep the lieutenant from getting shot. Well, the sergeant's just going to have to rationalize that decision with two things. One, you don't have a choice, and two, the lieutenant is going to be making sure the sergeant doesn't get shot. You know I love you, Britt, she beamed, but one of these days you're going to get it. After we take care of business, Sergeant Daly. Gunnery Sergeant, ma'am. Yeah, they kissed again. Chapter 40 When Hart said this thing was deserted, she wasn't kidding, Lucas Moody said. The only illumination in the Dunkirk airlock was from the Argent Marines and their helmet lights. Yilly? I'm on it, sir. The engineer pulled one of the junction boxes loose and patched in her diagnostic unit. Reactors operating at mass maintenance temperature only, sir. Just enough to emit a signature, but not enough to produce excess power. All energy damps are in. Vessel is operating on battery power only. Life support is down. Air temperature minus 210. No oxygen content. All systems offline. Battery status? Hunter asked, a tone of annoyance already creeping in. 17% and stable. Makes sense. There's nothing running on this vessel. Sir? Yes, Colonel. Hunter was busy training his lights on the bulkheads and ceilings, checking for structural damage. There are atmospheric compounds in this ship incompatible with human life. 
5% of the gas mixture here is sulfuric acid. I'm also reading bromine crystals. Will that affect our tax suits, engineer? Negative. As long as you keep your anti-static and temperature fields up, your suits will repel all non-ionized elements in the atmosphere, Yili replied. It shouldn't affect communications either, Zoni added. I recommend we stay off the intraship until we secure engineering and the bridge. Good call, Lieutenant, Hunter replied. Where would elements like that come from? Moody asked. Unknown. Bromine is used as a sealant in high-pressure lamp assemblies. The sulfuric acid could be coming from anywhere, Yili said. Colonel, run a life signs check again, Hunter said. The captain couldn't shake the suspicion there was something about this situation that just wasn't right. Everything was too well organized aboard the Dunkirk. It was as if... Scanning. Affirmative, Captain. I have respiration readings on Deck 12 aft. Whatever they are, they're not breathing oxygen. A shudder swept through the boarding party's marine contingent. Some of the men clutched their weapons tighter. How many? At least a dozen, possibly more. Volume and temperature readings indicate alien life forms in the 300-pound range. Hunter to Argent. Nothing. The captain activated his comlink's permanent connection to T-Hawk 8. The signal was not returned. What the hell? Hunter looked out the airlock's port. There was nothing visible on the Dunkirk's starboard side. In fact, the stars were completely different than Hunter remembered them. We're not in Gitarn anymore. What? Moody asked, checking the port nearest him. Where is Argent? A better question, Colonel, is where are we? Just then, the thrum of approaching footsteps echoed outside the airlock. Captain Hunter hefted his weapon, set the power output to maximum, and pulled the bolt. He spoke calmly and efficiently. Weapons free, ladies and gentlemen. Maximum power amplification. Target anything not wearing an Argent insignia. Fire at will. Every order was by the book. In fact, the orders were issued in the recommended order from the book. The Argent Marine Squad quietly and quickly configured their equipment and engaged their tack suit magnetic and power deflectors. Colonel Moody was as impressed as anyone else in the squad. Jason Hunter had made a career out of seat-of-the-pants decision-making, but it always seemed when the time came to lead by example, he was able to set aside the hip-shooting frame of mind and do things so as to satisfy a regular line officer his duty had been done. Then again, this wasn't the first time Moo had served alongside the captain in a crucial situation, and it certainly wasn't the first time he had seen Hunter switch from Maverick to Regulation Skywatch. Yili had stowed her engineering equipment and had a heavy blaster in each hand. Zoni was equally well-armed, except she settled for a single pistol. For a few moments, the sound outside stopped. The Argent landing party waited and listened. Only the hum from their equipment's power packs was audible. Even their highly sensitive triple-S antenna were silent. There was simply nothing inside or outside the room to translate into audio-visual or tactile information. Still, they waited. Hunter watched the tiny chronometer he had set. Twenty-six seconds had passed since the sound had stopped. There were no other anomalous readings of any kind. Things were beginning to exceed reason. Only a mechanism would be capable of remaining motionless long enough for the sensitive triple-S circuitry to completely lose track of it at such short ranges. Even through a ship's bulkheads, there would be respiration, heartbeat, circulation, weight settling, weight shifting, something. Colonel, uh, it happened so fast no human being would have been able to react in time. A calamitous explosion of sound, metal, energy discharge, and organic brute force obliterated the airlock's inboard bulkhead and filled the room with an enormous dark, vaguely insect-like shape. Whatever it was, it had a hard, chitinous shell of some kind. A razor-sharp combination of claw and pincer slashed across the chamber, slamming three marines against the metal wall. Its bulk twisted and it prepared another attack. <laughs> Colonel Moody was far enough away from the creature to take aim. He pumped at least nine conch rounds from his TK-40 into the creature's side. Each shot strobed white in the suddenly crowded space. Hot fluids, wispy smoke, and broken pieces of the creature's shell exploded in all directions. There was a high-pitched, dissonant scream consisting of at least a half-dozen different voices, followed by a spasm that crushed Mu, Yili, and two other marines up against the opposite wall. Once the creature careened to the opposite side, Captain Hunter was able to pull himself far enough out of the way to move. Realizing he didn't have room to aim his weapon, he drew two seven-inch sonic knives from his tack harness and raised them as high as he could reach. 
Using all of his strength and weight, he plunged both weapons into the creature's shell. The contact blades energized the moment they hit the solid carapace. It was the melee equivalent of setting off two shaped charges against a solid obstacle. The shell cracked and shattered in all directions. Blue and white electrical energy arced across its back. Hunter held on to the two knives' hilts as long as he could. The vibrations rapidly became unbearable and threatened to transmit dangerously powerful sympathetic vibrations into his skeletal structure. Moments before the bones in his hands shattered, he released his grip and fell back. The knives continued doing what they were designed to do. Once in contact with a solid object, their internal power systems poured more and more energy into a narrow-field sonic envelope carried by the gas synthesis produced from the weapon's electrical capacitors. The destructive effect was terrifying. They operated on roughly the same principle as an underwater welding torch, producing all of their own chemicals, power, and destructive motion. The sound rapidly became unbearable. The marine tax suits compensated by producing and amplifying a counterwave. The knives bored their way into the creature, causing more screams and more spasm-like slamming attacks against the Argent squad. The creature threw itself back in Hunter's direction, which freed the colonel's weapon again. He and Yili opened fire with brutal effect. The TK-40 blasted two ragged wounds the creature's side. Yili's weapons punctured two of its legs and the muscle structures where they attached to its body. It swiped at them weakly, but missed. Finally, it sank to the floor, twitching. Hunter retrieved his knives. Did you say a dozen, Colonel? If we don't count the ones that just appeared on Deck 6, sir. Chapter 41 Attention Unidentified Personnel This is Captain Uriah V. Cleghorn, DSS Exeter First Marines. You are hereby ordered to surrender your weapons and stand down. If you do not comply, we have orders to engage with lethal force. Acknowledge. Cleghorn was well aware of the fact the jamming field likely attenuated any possibility his message was received, but regulations required any marine assault force approaching a friendly target to make at least one challenge. Twin boats from Exeter roared towards the cargo locks located in a ring around Survey Station 19's center section. They were relatively large egress points for the facility, designed to soft-lock most vessels in the 100-000 ton and up freighter classes. Each boat held 31 heavily armed marines in fully powered tack suits. The personnel bay shook and heaved as the assault boat twisted and banked in its evasive approach pattern. I need an escort to records, Lieutenant Hawkins announced. Hers was the only suit in the blue and silver colors of Skywatch fleet. All 30 of the other tack suits were decorated with the green and gold of the Skywatch marines. Hers was, of course, one of only three with an officer's insignia and transponder. We do this one by the numbers, Lieutenant, Cleghorn replied. We don't know what we're up against yet. I want to hit the deck with everyone squared away. Squad order two by two, and you secure every hatch corner and light switch from hell to breakfast. Is that understood, Marines? The platoon barked a hearty rah in unison. We need to secure the landing party first, Hawkins said. I think I know what's going on in there. Cleghorn turned to look back at the fleet officer. As you were, Hawkins. You may outrank every sergeant aboard Exeter, but this is my company, my command. You will follow my orders during this mission without question. Is that understood, Lieutenant? Hawkins was used to having the upper hand when interacting with Exeter Marines. There was a lot she was allowed to get away with around certain gunnery sergeants and enlisted. One, because she was his fiancé, and two, because for the last year or so she always had the option to playfully pull rank. But here, 100 miles out from a potentially deadly firefight, there was one inescapable fact. A Marine captain outranked a fleet junior lieutenant, and Hawkins had now cashed in her one free screw-up. The look on Cleghorn's face told her further outbursts were unlikely to be tolerated. Yes, sir. Outstanding. Rollins, hand me that exterminator. A Marine corporal who could have easily passed for a starting defensive lineman on any championship-caliber pro football team reached up and dislodged an oversized shotgun from its wall mount and handed it to the captain. He inspected the weapon quickly and cocked it with a satisfying click-clack sound. Captain has the point. A rapid-fire series of communications was exchanged between the station's security systems and the two assault boats. The Exeter, of course, had all the necessary security overrides, as it was a Skywatch ship attempting to re-establish contact with a Skywatch survey station. 
The docking systems aboard Station 19 authorized the approach of the two Marine shock platoons and set the bay doors to external control. The boats approached very quickly, only applying their counter-thrusters at a range of 200 meters for final approach. They fast locked into the station's approach control lanes, immediately overrode all the safety mechanisms and established magnetic contacts with the outside bay assemblies. Five seconds later, both ships had soft locks with the station's hull. The doors breached and twin platoons of power-armored marines poured into the cargo bay, weapons raised, sweeping the field of fire. Captain Cleghorn was first to touch the deck. Not a word was spoken. A group of ten streamed right. Another group rapidly covered the distance across the bay to the personnel hatches. Around them were various conveyor assemblies, overhead cranes, loaders, and pressurized containers. There was minimal light, but all of the Marines had fully equipped tack suits with independent helmet lights and a variety of range-finding options, including infrared, magnetic, and scatterband. Cleghorn caught movement in one corner of the largest open area and raised his weapon to advance. Exeter Marines, hands where I can see them. A tentative burst of weapons fire answered. The sound of energy ricochets echoed in the huge bay. Another burst blasted pieces of the floor in all directions. Cleghorn dove to one side and grunted when his back hit the containers he was now using for cover. Hostiles, look sharp! Light strobed as short bursts of energy fire were exchanged. Given the number of obstacles in the room, it wasn't surprising most of the shots hit inanimate objects rather than their targets. Cleghorn heard running footsteps and consulted his tactical map. Six targets bearing 310. He scrambled back to his feet and ran to a vantage point behind the barrier of pressure containers. He arrived at the corner of the stack at exactly the right moment. Hey! One of the intruders turned and pointed his weapon, but it was too late. Boom! The twin slugs from Cleghorn's rail-assisted shotgun blew a foot-wide hole in the intruder's torso. Click-clack! He reloaded and moved up to a more aggressive vantage point just in time for one of the load frames to explode in dozens of mangled metal pieces overhead. Another blast of energy streamed past. Rapid-fire bolts sprayed across the open area in front of the captain. He waited patiently until the enemy power pack drained, then he exploded from cover like a lawman in an old west prairie town. Boom! A cry of pain echoed. Click-clack! Boom! Click-clack! Uh, boom! The third intruder's startled shout faded quickly. Three shots, three neutralized intruders. Cleghorn marched forward, turning his weapons barrel skyward and reaching into his bandolier for a slug pack. He reloaded. Click-clack. A moment later, another intruder emerged from cover with his weapon pointed the wrong way. He turned an instant too late. Boom! His left leg was vaporized by an exterminator slug. Click-clack. Boom! His gurgling scream was silenced. The flash of a much heavier weapon drove Cleghorn back into cover. The deck shook with explosions from overloaded concussion rounds. Second squad, report. Maximum of eight, sir. Retreating along a 215 and headed for the magneto lifts. Affirmative. Secure your position and stand by. Comms, what's the status on intrastation communications? Working on it, sir. Work faster, son. I want to know where the hell the commander is, and I want to know right now. Chapter 42 Is he okay? Uh-huh. Echo was putting the finishing touches on Ensign Cliver's recovery. His condition was now medically stable by most criteria. I'm glad, Butterfly said. I wish we could talk to Lunar. I bet he's having so much fun on the big spaceship. It's been so long since I saw all my friends on Exeter. We could talk to him if I could see the ship, Butterfly said. Remember when we talked on the loss that one time? Uh-huh. Rebel was being funny and yelling about stuff. He's always so serious. Commander Hunter was busy monitoring the EM situation with her handheld signals analysis unit, but somewhere in her subconscious she was also listening intently to Echo and Butterfly's conversation. Something had gotten her attention and she couldn't shake the feeling this was one conversation she should be part of. Tom, listen, she whispered. Commander Huggins perked up and watched Jace Hunter's raised eyebrows as the two little minibots conversed. Yeah, I remember that. When Rebel was running around and trying to hide from the laser net, he didn't know you were watching him from way up in the sky. That's why I could always find him when we play hide-and-seek. I think that's why AC gave him new engines and stuff, because he was mad he couldn't win like before. I don't get it, Huggins whispered. Hunter kept her voice low. They're talking about lost communications, laser-assisted data networking. 
same stuff Skywatch uses for their electronic warfare protocols. Yeah, same stuff we use for battle conditions. Butterfly knows how to do loss communications and so does Lunar. It hit Tom in an instant. Loss can't be jammed. All we need now is a window. Commander Hunter crouched down by Lieutenant Sutherland. How is she doing? Hi, AC, Echo chirped. She's sleepy now, but everyone's all better. Butterfly, do you remember how to do loss communications with the other minibots? Hunter asked. Yes, I do. It's really easy once you taught us how. Do you think you could find a port on the opposite side of the station and talk to Lunar for me? And do you think you could relay communications from my designator to the Exeter Bridge? Yeah, if Lunar is out in space, I can see him and send him messages. Then let's get started. I need you to fly back to where Rebel and Wave are and find the hatch Lunar used to leave the station. It will have a port in it. Use that port to establish lost contact with Lunar and set up a comnet with my designator and the Exeter Bridge. Okay. Can I go too? Echo asked plaintively. I need you to stay here and take care of my officers, Hunter replied with a smile. You're doing a great job. Ah, Echo whined. Then she turned to face the little helicopter. I have to go, Butterfly said. I know. Send me a message if you get in trouble and I'll come help you, Echo said. Call me if you need help and I'll come help you too, Butterfly replied. The humans watched the two little minibots reassure each other with wonder in their eyes. It was very much like watching two best friends on moving day for one of them. Even through her drowsiness, Sutherland was certain they would have hugged each other goodbye if they could. Finally, Butterfly engaged her engines and brought her rotors to flight velocity. She rose quietly from the deck and pivoted towards the exit. Echo followed her to the door and watched her fly away. Then she rolled back to Lieutenant Sutherland's side and resumed monitoring the two wounded officers' vital signs. Hunter noted Echo had quietly activated her wide-spectrum monitoring antenna. She might not have been able to go with her friend, but she was now listening intently on more than 16,000 broadcast frequencies for Butterfly's designator. If the little helicopter shouted, Jace knew Echo would be there before the sound faded. Perhaps that's an even more apt description of the little robot's namesake, Hunter thought. She switched frequencies on her EM monitoring unit and waited for Butterfly's signal. Chapter 43 We've got to get out in the open, Skipper, Colonel Moody said. In a cramped space like this, we can't use any of our advanced weapons capabilities. Even a corridor is better than this airlock. How many, Lieutenant? Hunter asked as he helped one of the landing party Marines fix his environmental controls. Now more than 40 confirmed readings, sir, Zoni replied. I estimate a new creature appears roughly once every 160 seconds. Yili, what if we rigged the environmental controls to repressurize the ship with an atmosphere poisonous to the creatures? Curtis shook her head. That level of environmental control would take an hour to establish, and that's only if I can get to engineering. I doubt we can fight our way that far down, sir. And even if we did, we could get pinned and not be able to get back to the bridge, Moo added. We can fight our way out, sir, one of the Marines said. Just give me a target. You'll get your shot, Sergeant, Moo replied. What can we do from here, engineer? Hunter asked. I can restart the mains and power up the ship in about 20 minutes if we ignore the checklist, sir. But with respect, where to? We can't operate all the systems on the Dunkirk without more manpower, and even if we could, we have nowhere to go. Hunter's eyebrow rose, which intrigued the colonel. Then Jason grinned, and Moo could tell he was onto something. What about maneuvering? Sure, I guess. If we can get to the bridge and barricade ourselves in there, we can drive around for a while. We can't use the jump engines without navigational and SRS personnel, though. Sublight is doable within reason, Yili replied. Reason? Moo asked. Then without shields or armor power, we don't want to get going too fast to avoid debris or obstacles. We don't need to go anywhere, Hunter said. We just need to be able to stop. Sir? Our guests don't have seatbelts, and if we conveniently forget to activate the drive field, they're going to get a first-class education in what it's like to ride in a moving van during a Mach 1 slalom event. Let's get to the bridge. Zoni, you keep us out of our guests' way. The captain hefted his weapon and peered out into the loading deck corridor. It was clear in both directions. Smartly now. Hunter slid up the airlock corridor quietly and took a cover position at the junction with the cross tunnel that led to the Dunkirk's magneto lifts. Nothing on this deck, sir, 
Zoni said quietly over the squad comm link. Watch our back, Moo, Hunter said. Affirmative, Skipper. Hunter led the column swiftly along the cross tunnel while Zoni kept her local area sensors locked on the creature's biological profile. What about the lifts, Yili? Hunter asked. They have auto power systems, sir. They'll run off the batteries without any extra work. Outstanding. Hunter stopped at the airlock deck core structure and looked around with his helmet lights. The ship's interior was beginning to show signs of condensation. Water vapor in the residual atmosphere was gathering on flat surfaces and cooling to a liquid state as the internal temperature fell. Every boarding party member's suit was reading the atmospheric pressure at about 7 pounds per square inch and air temperature at just over 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Lift 4 to the bridge, Yili, Mu, and Zoni first. Marine squad in lift 3. I'll follow you up. Sir, I... Understood, Colonel. These two are more important. Let's go. The Argent senior officers didn't look convinced, but they followed their orders. In a few moments, lifts three and four were on their way to deck one. Hunter moved around the core structure to lift two and saw that it was operational. He keyed in the universal access code and listened as the pressure door released the seal. He trained his weapon on the lift car as the doors opened, but there was nothing waiting for him except an empty space. He climbed aboard and keyed deck one. I don't understand where the crew went. Zoni said as the squad occupied the Dunkirk Bridge. If they were forced off the ship, that would be one thing. But how do you get 170 people to involuntarily abandon ship? That's a very good question. There wasn't much of a fight because I haven't seen a single mark anywhere on this ship, the colonel said as he directed his squad to take up defensive positions at the two bridge entrances. He keyed his comlink. Skipper? Zoni and Yili set to work reactivating the strike cruiser's systems. The first priority would be to generate a position report and get at least auxiliary power operational. As long as all the control systems were in place, it wouldn't take long. An entire Marine squad guarded the two officers and the bridge while they did their vital work. Skipper? Moo said again. He waited and listened to the silent channel. Jason Hunter exited lift two and quickly made his way up the deck one center corridor to the bridge entrance. Deck one was empty. Chapter 44 an indicator light appeared on Commander Hunter's EM unit. It signaled contact with Butterfly and the newly established communications network between herself, Butterfly, Lunar, and DSS Exeter. They were still limited by Hunter's need to use short-range wideband frequencies, but it did give her a voice channel with the task force. Exeter Pierce. Afternoon, Commander. Ma'am, you've defeated the interference? In a manner of speaking, patch me through to the Fury Bridge. Affirmative. Switching nets. A moment passed. Fury, Mallory. Lieutenant, I need you to do me a favor. Commander, it's a relief to hear your voice again. How can Fury help you? Configure the ECCM antenna to all voice-capable frequencies north of the data wave on this channel. Wait 30 seconds, then direct maximum power on all frequencies to everything within a mile of my coordinates and maintain broadcasts for 60 seconds. I will re-establish contact then. Hunter out. The commander quickly reconfigured her handheld unit. She utilized her minibot's op codes to instruct them all to shut down their receivers so as to avoid the destructive signal that was about to be beamed at them. Okay, Tom, let's close that hatch. It's going to get ugly out there in a minute. Huggins helped Commander Hunter bar the records lab door as best he could. Moments after the pressure seal indicators shifted to green, a buzzing sound became audible outside. Echo, shut down your antennas. But I won't be able to hear Butterfly. It's okay. I can hear her on this unit. I don't want your systems to be damaged. The ship is going to send us a really powerful signal in a second. Okay. Echo didn't sound convinced. The buzzing sound increased intensity by several orders of magnitude and the hatch began to vibrate. The lights went out in the outside corridor and flickered in the weapons lab. Finally, a thump sounded followed by a bang. Hunter was watching her EM unit's timer. The moment it hit 60 seconds, the sound vanished. She keyed her inner ship channel. Hunter to Fury. Fury, Mallory here. Enemy jamming equipment has been neutralized. We're back on the air, Lieutenant. Give me the shock leader's designator. Stand by, landing party. Saddle up, Commander. I want prisoners. Huggins retrieved his weapons and the equipment pack. Echo, I need you to clear all combat frequencies, reestablish contact with all minibots, and get me a sit rep right away. Go to alert condition three. Signal silent. Okay. 
the little ambulance reactivated her high-gain antennas and began sending scrambled status response opcodes to the rest of the data network. Within moments, she had permanent multi-frequency channels with all nine task force ships, the marine shock platoons, and four minibots on the same network. Not bad for a collection of toys, Commander, Huggins said as he unlocked the pressure door. Not bad at all, Hunter replied with a grin. The two officers emerged from the records lab and began making their way back up the corridor towards Rebel and Wave's perimeter. I have Captain Cleghorn on priority frequency, Commander. Very good, Lieutenant. Switch us over, if you please. Hunter waited a moment or two. Captain Hunter here. Status report. Good to hear your voice, ma'am. We're clear to Deck 5 and we'll rendezvous with you at Station Control Platform 3. Affirmative. I need a medical evac from the records lab before we do any heavy lifting. Echo has the coordinates. Hunter out. She switched her comm link back. Mallory, I want a full sensor sweep of this station. Find those intruders now. I want bearing and distance in 30 seconds. Yes, ma'am. Stand by for telemetry. The task force flagship turned gradually in the direction of Survey Station 19, bringing all of her most powerful sensors and detection equipment to bear. Life Sciences personnel configured the automatic data collection routines and the sensors began a systematic analysis of every cubic foot of the station's internal volume. Got him, Commander. Deck 2 bearing... Hunter heard someone typing on a control station in the background. Bearing 107 Mark 200, true your position. Range 80 yards, XY plane true. That's the observation deck. Report force alert status. All vessels are maintaining general quarters per your orders, ma'am. Watch for sudden appearances of enemy vessels. Under no circumstances allow enemy personnel to evacuate this station or any ship to approach it. Ma'am, we have negative contact with unauthorized personnel aboard the station. Say again, Fury? They're gone. Previous contact is no longer showing up on the scope. Give me a contact scan of the station perimeter quickly. Stand by. Hunter listened as voices murmured in the background. Mallory could be heard issuing orders. Negative contact. My only external contact is King 1. No change in aspect. Hunter ripped her comm link off and threw it down the corridor. After trying to compose herself and failing, she slumped back against the bulkhead. The minute that jamming equipment went south, they ran up the stairs to Deck 2 and vanished, she sighed. We almost bought the farm for nothing. Maybe not. We did get the records and sensor data we came for. I wouldn't be surprised if we can glean something useful from all the data we gathered during the fight. I hope so. I want to know how my enemy keeps blinking out the moment we get close. It is a mystery, Huggins concluded. I don't like mysteries, Commander. Chapter 45 After doing what he could to find his crew, Captain Hunter set about to analyzing the Dunkirk's communication systems. There was always an outside chance a full suite of communications equipment would be able to do what a tax suit based portable system couldn't. He had the power he needed. Yili did say the batteries were at 17%. After confirming this fact for himself, he set the ship's communications on maximum broadcast bandwidth and keyed the transmitter. Hunter to landing party, come in. He waited the regulation ten seconds. Hunter to landing party, respond please. Nothing was audible on any of the ship's pickups. The captain quickly configured the system to broadcast his hail at ten-second intervals and set his personal comm link to relay the Dunkirk's response frequencies before moving to the short-range sensor station. Meanwhile, on the Dunkirk bridge, Zoni was working as fast as she was able to locate the captain's comm link designator. Anything? Moo asked. Zoni shook her head. The last auto response we got was from Lift 2, but these readings don't make any sense. It's almost as if... As if what? Okay, look at this. Zoni pulled up the frequency analysis track and superimposed it on the position tracking of Hunter's comlink. Here, right when he steps into Lift 2, all of the frequency tracking spikes into third and fourth harmonics and we lose his signal. Nine seconds later, we get the base frequency and the harmonic at the same time index, giving our comm links a chance to reacquire his signal for 0 .005 seconds. Then the base signal disappears again and we lose his track. Now you could call this coincidence except for that second blip. His appearance and disappearance is exactly coordinated with that base signal. Meaning you can get a fix on his position. I already did. 
If I set our frequency cycle to his harmonic range, I reacquire his signal, but at a different time index. From our perspective, time is passing 100 times faster for him. I know that because the time index on his comm link is already registering a couple of days in the future. Could that be a systems malfunction? Mu asked, desperately trying to keep up with Zoni's formidable intellect. Not unless the laws of physics are different wherever he is. You said you had a fix on his position. Where? He's on the bridge of this ship. Mu just stared. As he worked furiously to get a fix on the Dunkirk's position, Captain Hunter's comlink beeped, indicating he had received a response to his hail. He keyed his transmitter. Hunter here. I see you simply won't be deterred, Captain. Hunter face froze in a combination of shock and recognition. He rose to his feet and activated the main viewer. The face of Admiral Hughes appeared. He was still wearing his Skywatch uniform, but it was decorated with a number of strange insignia. He also had odd marks on his face. They looked as if they were from some kind of pigment. Admiral, I have orders to take you into custody and return you to Skywatch Fleet Command for debriefing. Hughes chuckled. By the book, I have to say I'm impressed, Jason. You took to your training much more readily than I first believed. I'll kindly ask that you address me by my proper rank, sir. Not in a mood for a reunion with your old teacher? Well, I suppose I deserve that. But I'm no longer a Skywatch Admiral, Captain. I have been offered a much more valuable role in the world to come. With all due respect, sir, what the hell are you talking about? The army that is preparing to conquer the core systems has granted me the title of Warlord. I will deliver the human race to our sovereign. He will decide if they live or die. If you live, it will be to serve the Ithis. If you die, be safe in the knowledge you gave your lives to advance a far more worthy species. So You're already facing court-martial for a number of offenses, Admiral. Do you really want to add treason to your indictment? Captain, there is no jurisdiction known to man with the power to enforce its will on me. I have ten million warriors at my back and a fleet of starships with enough firepower to annihilate the human race in a matter of weeks. We're not talking about a war here. We're talking about the complete obliteration of every planet man has ever set foot on. Stop it, Admiral. You're scaring me. You have an opportunity here, Jason. You have a chance to fulfill your commission in ways no other Skywatch captain has ever dreamed of. You can save mankind. You can literally save every man, woman, and child alive if you're intelligent enough to recognize where you stand in history. The Ithis Empire spans galaxies. Mankind is a mosquito infestation in comparison. Surely I don't have to remind the Admiral what mosquitoes can do to an arrogant population. Mankind never employed antimatter weapons against insects. Admiral, would you mind carrying a message to the Ithis Sovereign for me? It would certainly save us all a lot of time and it might earn you some more paint for your face. Hughes's expression did not change. He replied with a deadpan sarcastic tone. What message is that, Captain? You tell him if he plans to exterminate the human race, he better bring his lunch. Hunter out. Ah. The channel closed abruptly and Hunter went back to adjusting the Dunkirk's short-range sensors. A strange signal flickered on Zoni's frequency analysis display. Colonel? Do we have sensor coordinates yet? Mu asked. Ah. Negative, but we're getting some kind of intermittent transmission on that base frequency. It's happening in microsecond length bursts, however, so there's barely enough time to register it's there, much less do an analysis on it. Auxiliary power restored, Yili announced. We can't move. You're aware of the inverse square law? Signal strength is inversely proportional to the distance from the source? Close enough, Colonel, Zoni smiled. It's theoretically exponentially true across dimensions. If the captain is on some other plane of existence, a movement of even a few inches could put him permanently out of range of any signal we can muster. Helmet station keeping engineer, Mu ordered. Colonel, we've got hostiles on the move. Now on deck three and approaching the core magneto lifts, Yili announced. The marines at the bridge entrances braced themselves and hefted their weapons. Get a fix on him, lieutenant, now. The look on Mu's face left no room for interpretation. All due respect, sir, even if we get the captain back into our dimension, what's our plan? Zoni asked. We're going to do what the captain originally planned, use this ship to beat those damn bugs to a pulp. Chapter 46 Captain on the Bridge
Lieutenant Mallory relinquished Fury's center chair to Commander Hunter. Jace put a hand on Mallory's shoulder, and the two women exchanged a moment's regard for one another. Then the lieutenant returned to her station. Hunter took her seat and swiveled to face the forward screen. Comms, bring me up on the JA. Signal all ships. Task Force Perseus. Affirmative, Commander. The clear channel signal sounded from every comlink intraship station and signal receiver aboard nine starships simultaneously. Attention all stations. Attention all stations. This is Perseus Force Command on Priority Channel. Stand by for a message from the flag. The communications net quickly switched all receivers to green and the Fury signals officer nodded to Jace. This is Commander Hunter aboard the Fury. All vessels stand down from quarters. Maintain intruder protocols. Survey Station 19 has been secured. The task force will plot a course to Gitarn Sector 10 to relieve the Starship Argent. Spruance has the point. All vessels report navigational readiness on Signal Buster. Flag out. The comms officer closed the channel and switched communications nets to receive priority navigational computer signals. Helm, bring the fury about. New course 110 Mark 31. Stand by to engage the mains. Aye, ma'am. Helm responding. Mains at your command. A yeoman stepped up alongside Hunter's command chair. Ma'am, I have a request from one of the Exeter's signals officers for a moment. Have Tom handle it, Hunter replied as she examined a handheld tablet. I have dorsal hull damage to inspect. She says she has information on what the station intruders were looking for. Who has that information? Where? Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins, ma'am. She's waiting in the executive inboard cabin on deck three. Who the hell is Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins? Uh, ma'am, uh, she's the second watch signal. Belay the question, yeoman. Dismissed. The yeoman vanished in ways only yeoman who recognize an angry CO can. Mallory. You have the con. The Fury's third officer looked up in surprise as Hunter walked through the bridge entrance hatch, grumbling. Captain's off the bridge. The door to the inboard executive cabin opened abruptly. Attention on deck. Two Exeter Marines and three fleet officers rose to attention in a snap instant as Commander Hunter and Lieutenant Commander Huggins entered. The Fury XO closed the door and then hesitated a moment before standing at attention himself. The Fury's captain did not give the customary order to allow the occupants of the spacious room to stand at rest. That non-action instantly set everyone's nerves on edge. I'm not going to ask the question because that would presume there are personnel aboard this ship who believe they have the choice whether or not to answer me. I'm only going to say this. If I don't walk out of this room with a 5x5 five five understanding of every last detail of just what the hell is going on in this command, I will find the person or persons responsible and have them skinned. Lieutenant Hawkins swallowed nervously. Captain, what is the status of Exeter? The intruders escaped in much the same way our enemy escaped aboard the station, ma'am. One minute they were there, the next they were gone, Cleghorn replied. An explosives alarm went off, but we believe that was a malfunction. Further analysis indicated no weapons present. Very well, Hunter replied. Gunnery Sergeant Daly, what is your involvement in this? Ma'am, Exeter First Marines were alerted to the intruders by the lieutenant. I was informed she responded to a signal from Echo during the first attack. Hunter glared at Hawkins. Seems to me all roads lead back to you, Lieutenant. Report. The look on the commander's face told Hawkins she was in no mood for nonsense, so Hawkins led with her biggest bombshell. The station intruders were on deck six first for a reason, ma'am. And how do you know that? Echo's first alarm was sounded nine minutes before you were attacked in the records lab. Echo sounded that alarm on deck six. They weren't counting on being discovered, and I now believe they got there the same way they left. Hunter continued glaring at Hawkins. The rest of you are dismissed. Ma'am, there's... That will be all, Captain. Hunter still didn't look up. Cleghorn hesitated a moment, then assented. Aye, ma'am. Everyone stepped past the Fury XO quietly, the last one out closed the door. Lieutenant J.G. Hawkins, I don't know where you got the idea you were on some kind of secret mission in my task force, but I've got news for you and you better listen close. The next time you decide to freelance in my fleet, I'll bust you down to a two-stripe mud roller and have you cleaning spoons in a crap house before the next bell rings. Do you read me, miss? Yes, ma'am, I thought. The next time, you think after you get permission, Lieutenant, Hunter snapped. 
So help me if I have to give that order twice, I'll have the quartermaster signing written requisitions for you to change your socks every morning. Permission to speak free. Denied. Hawkins intensified her posture and blinked, desperately trying to hoist herself out of the fire. Jace. Hunter gave Huggins a look that forced him back to attention. His voice was considerably stronger. Permission to speak freely, Commander. Hunter's glare at the lieutenant only intensified. Be brief. I spoke to Commander Pierce aboard Exeter. Hawkins discovered the intruders, ma'am. There's ample reason to believe she simply didn't have time to prudently follow the chain of command. Is that true, Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. I was prepared to report to the commander after I verified my suspicions firsthand. She was being shot at, Skipper. Hunter glared. It all sounded like the kind of confusion she had long since banished from her ships. Stand easy, Lieutenant. Hawkins shifted to the regulation rest stance, clasping her hands behind her back. Hunter collapsed into one of the comfortable chairs and pinched her eyebrows together. That will be all, Commander. Aye, ma'am. Huggins dismissed himself and closed the door. Several moments passed before Hunter looked up again. The lieutenant stared straight ahead, focusing her attention on the Fury insignia plaque on the opposite side of the room. They taught you discipline at the academy, did they not? Yes, ma'am. So you understand the danger involved in taking the initiative without at least telling someone what the hell you're up to? Yes, ma'am. And I trust we won't be having this discussion again, will we, Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins? No, ma'am. Permission to speak freely granted. What is going on at Station 19? Hawkins tried to relax, but her body wouldn't obey. Ma'am. She cleared her throat nervously. Ma'am, the intruders were on Deck 6 looking for survey probe communications designators. How do you know that? It was part of my signal's practical at the Academy, ma'am. Our objective was to defeat a fleet maneuver using only a subset of our operational protocols. All survey stations store their probe network analysis equipment on their sixth deck. I used that knowledge to reprogram a series of survey probes to respond with the wrong navigational data and to do it with the wrong vessel designators. By the time the simulated enemy fleet realized their mistake, they were facing a three-to-one disadvantage in the least favorable region of space. Hawkins took a breath. Ma'am. What is your theory? The intruders have Skywatch training, ma'am. That's the only way they would know what to look for and where to find it. Hunter rose to her feet and placed her hands flat on the table. Now that's useful, Hawkins. Explain. With genuine information from those probes, they would know what ships were in Gitarn space and where they were deployed. With a little time, they would also be able to extrapolate patrol routes and timing. And know exactly when and where to strike? Affirmative, Commander. I think you bought yourself a temporary reprieve, Lieutenant, Hunter said. You ran the wrong play, threw the ball to the wrong receiver, and managed to score a touchdown anyway. Thank you, ma'am. Don't ever do it again or I'll drop you in a hole so deep they'll have to airmail you light. Do I make myself clear? You do, ma'am. Very well. Dismissed. Chapter 47 Wait, wait, I think I've got it, Zoni shouted. Yili, transfer maximum power to the low-band emitters in our SRS relays. Low-band? But that... Give me that power, Yili. The engineer reconfigured the power board. The bridge lights flickered as the energy sources switched over from auxiliary reactors to batteries. Suddenly, Zoni's circuits were flooded with excess energy. She poured it all into her short-range sensors. The purpose wasn't to find anything in particular. It was to drive as much power on the SRS wavelengths as possible. Finally, one of them matched the communications harmonics and all the visible light on the bridge changed color subtly. Zoni, what are you doing? Colonel Moody shouted. All the visible wavelengths on the bridge shifted blue, which made all the instruments glow with an otherworldly haze. Cover your ears, everyone, Zoni shouted. A sound like a continuous loop of glass breaking began to echo over itself louder and louder. Everyone switched their triple S systems to compensate for the noise, which rapidly peaked far above 200 decibels. Anything that wasn't attached to the deck or bulkheads began to rattle violently. Several items clattered to the floor. A ghostly afterimage that looked like the outline of a human form faded into view. It was almost completely transparent, but it was visible enough to see a distinct outline. It moved as if trying to get the Argent boarding party's attention. A shattered voice echoed, sounding very much like a sound wave pulled apart in packets over a digital voice connection. 
And the signals officer looked like she understood what the captain was saying and she scrambled at her controls. The light shifted even more intensely into the ultraviolet spectrum and the vibrations strengthened. Millions of volts poured into the gigantic SRS magnets under the bridge deck. The huge energy loads began to ionize the internal atmosphere. Static electricity popped and arced off the energy shields on the boarding party's tack suits. Zoni, shift harmonics by 1.5. The voice ripped through the air like a point-blank lightning strike. Zoni keyed the configuration command and punched the power to maximum. A series of vibrations that felt as if they might detach the Dunkirk's bridge from the rest of the ship pounded and ripped at the bulkheads and deck. One final blast of sonic energy exploded across the bridge, pulverizing several control panels. A moment later, Captain Jason Hunter stumbled forward and fell onto the bridge deck plates. Skipper! Several Marines, Yilly and Moo, ran to their captain's aid. Jason quickly regained his feet. Secure for maneuvering. Yili, transfer all power to sublight engines and stand by to engage auxiliary navigation. Everyone on the bridge reacted with well-practiced efficiency. In a matter of seconds, the entire boarding party was secured in four-point shock harnesses at stations all around the strike cruiser's bridge. Hostiles on deck two. Engineer, all engines aft flank. Aye, sir. Helm answering all engines aft. Flank speed. DSS Dunkirk forced the entire Argent boarding party forward in their shock harnesses until the weight and pressure threatened to cut off their ability to breathe, even through their tack suits. The enormous vessel accelerated backwards rapidly. All stop! Yilly punched the counter thrusters, and the vessel slowed in space so quickly, several of the Argent marines lost consciousness. Their heads lolled on their shoulders as Hunter drove the ship forward again. All ahead flank. Roll port 270 degrees. The vessel surged forward as the G-force alarms began to sound across all decks. Yili felt the mighty ship's structure begin to groan and complain at the fantastic loads being forced into its many stress points, but Captain Hunter was relentless. Starboard engines to 125%, port to 75%, reverse your roll 270 degrees starboard. The shearing forces caused at least two or three major bulkhead supports to buckle and threw everything aboard that wasn't secured into the opposite wall at a relative velocity exceeding 100 miles per hour. It was the equivalent of being locked in a metal box and thrown down a mountain. All back full. Yili slammed the velocity controls back again. The Dunkirk began cavitating, fighting her own pressure and momentum with the unbelievable forces generated by the auxiliary engines. An out-of-phase sympathetic vibration shook the vessel like an uneven wing in a wind tunnel. All stop! The Dunkirk came to rest in space. Only Zoni, Yili, and the captain were still conscious. Now give me a life signs report. Zoni studied her instruments for several seconds. Negative respiration, sir. I don't think anything organic could have survived that with no safety systems. Very well, Signals. Can you take the system we just improvised and apply it to the entire ship? Sir, it will pull us out of this region of space and put us back in contact with Argent. I'm going to need a ton of power for that much mass, Skipper. Engineer? Yili nodded. Outstanding. We need to get this vessel back intact. We're going to need her. Need her? For what, sir? Zoni asked. A war against someone who knows our tactics better than we do. Chapter 48 Task Force Perseus Arriving Bosun's pipe sounded, and a contingent of Argent 2nd Marines snapped to attention, their dress crimson and gold uniforms resplendent against the neutral colors of their battleship's primary flight deck. All wore the sleeve insignia of enlisted personnel from PFC to Strike Sergeant. Commander Jace Hunter appeared at the hatch of her command shuttle. It bore the distinctive raptor of her flag on its side, along with the designation of her flagship, DSS Fury, CX-704. She turned and performed a sharp regulation salute of the ensign, then saluted the officer of the deck. She looked quite impressive in her gray and gold uniform and garrison cap. She wore gleaming commander's insignia on collar and cover. Permission to come aboard. Very well, ma'am, the OOD replied. All by the book. A marine sergeant barked a command, and the entire marine line brought their weapons up to present arms with a piercing clack. The sergeant saluted as Commander Hunter stepped onto the deep crimson carpet that had been laid down for the ceremony. Her XO, Commander Huggins, followed, performing every salute in exactly the same order. One by one, the rest of the task force's command staff filed out. 
At the opposite end of the line of Marines stood Argent senior officers, all wearing their dress blues and covers. The Perseus contingent strode towards them. I forgot to tell you I saw a really nasty bug of some kind crawling up your pant leg, Captain Hunter whispered, elbowing his signals officer. Stop it, Zoni growled through gritted teeth. Commander Hunter stopped before her brother, came to regulation attention and saluted. Permission to come aboard, sir. Granted, Jason replied, returning the salute. Welcome aboard the Argent. You owe me a bottle, Commander. I got us out of space dock in one piece and all the way to Gitarn without bumping into anything. Then we're even, Jace replied. You've owed me a bottle since we rescued the St. Croix together. I have, Hunter said, scrunching up his face. I don't remember it quite that way. Then he grinned like he always did when he was trying to get the best of his sister. Jace rolled her eyes and stepped up to Commander Doverly. Honora, it's so nice to see you again. The two women exchanged salutes. Thank you for that nice card, Honora replied. It meant so much to me and I'm so glad to hear your nephew is doing so well. One by one, each Perseus officer greeted their counterparts aboard Argent. Once the formalities had been discharged, Captain Hunter summoned the quartermaster and his staff to see to the needs of their guests. I've scheduled a briefing at 0930, after which I'd be honored if you and your officers would attend the captain's table for dinner. Jace looked appropriately impressed. We would be honored. Thank you for the offer. Thank you, Captain, Huggins added with an appreciative smile. My pleasure, Jason replied, showing the task force officers towards the inboard corridor to the executive guest quarters. After the guests had proceeded into the corridor, Jason leaned over and spoke to Zoni in a quiet tone. I suppose I should be nice to my sister at least once before we all get blown out of space, right? Zoni slapped his arm.